it's my privilege to invite Dr. Yon Tenberg just to say a few words. Friends, colleagues, mentors, teachers, this gathering today is a very special gathering of people because I believe that in this room, the heart and soul of Jewish education of the Jewish people is here today. And I'm deeply honored that it is this morning of tribute which has brought this group together and I really hope that 10 or 20 percent of what we said is correct <laughs> and that ultimately in the future whatever has been promised in the past will be magnified in many, many ways. Having Howie, Alan and Avigdor is basically closing a circle. In 1989, Howie Dietscher, who'd recently moved into a frat, phones me up and he says to me, Jonathan, Mike Swirsky has resigned. We heard that you're specializing in adult education. How about thinking of our Jerusalem Fellows and ultimately the Florence Melton Adult Medical School? And my response to Howie was, I've heard of Jerusalem Fellows, but Florence, Melton, Adult, <coughs> Mini, School, what is that about? <laughs> but that was the beginning of a long working relationship, friendship. That conversation did for me the passion which has accompanied me to this very day in terms of my work in this field. So having Howie stand at this podium and chairing this, this morning is really the closing of the circle. Our second speaker, Alan, is much more than a blood relation than a cousin. Anyone who's worked with Alan who really understands what leadership is about. I teach social entrepreneurship, I teach social innovation. If there's one mentor who really has made a change in the Jewish people, who walks the talk and talks the walk, it's Alan Hoffman. He's very used to the foundations of the Melbourne Center how we operate, how we achieve things, the creativity, the boldness, the passion, the commitment. This is the DNA which Alan gave not only to the Franz Melton Mini School, not only to the Melton Center, but ultimately to the world of education of the Jewish people in his current field. Thirdly, uh, Victor. It's correct, Victor, I've known for many years. It's the last three years which have been challenging years, which the Victor is head of the academic committee, has been an absolute mentor in terms of understanding how the world functions, in terms of the university. And having a Victor, again, teaching us, and there's no greater teacher than Victor, I think is a fitting way in which to mark this tribute. Now this morning is a tribute. It's actually a tribute to all of you, because without you, the France Mountain Adult Mini School could never have happened. Alan spoke kindly about me personally, but neither do me. One person can do very, very little. This is a fantastic team effort. And it's a team effort which I think is a very, very important page of Jewish history. And at the head of this team, there are actually three or four teams. I'll be speaking about them. The first team, of course, is the team of the Melbourne family. I was taken to see Florence in 1991 by Alan. It was a historic meeting. I think from then on I spoke to Florence at least once a week until she passed time. When Gordon took over in 1998, 1999, this became a weekly discussion, which I think is continuing to this very day. Okay, Gordon. And in working with the mountains, this is a very different type of philanthropist which is in the Jewish world. These are people who are passionately involved, who ultimately really, really care and do everything to make it happen. And the most remarkable thing about the Melton story is, this is something, a DNA which goes from generation to generation. Sam Melton passed it on to Donnie, Friars passed it on to Gordon, Donnie passed it on to Lisa, who's here, and I think Lisa's passed it on to a daughter who's studying at the Hebrew University. I don't know of many philanthropic families who the vision is carried so fervently from generation to generation. The second team 
It's the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And I'm talking about the, the privilege and honor of working with the various presidents, Professor Chalak Goodfriend, Professor Magido, Professor Ben Sassan, all of whom played a pivotal role in ensuring that the mini school, and I'm using the concept mini school because that's the concept I grew up with, and it's, I understand that it's changed, but let's talk about it in an historical context in order to ensure that the mini school would be an important project to the university. But I don't kid myself. They had many, many things on their plate. And it wasn't for those who had a key to their hearts, and I'm talking about Shafi Belek, who literally had a key to Professor Magidur. And I'm talking about Chaim Mizrahi, who has the key to Professor Ben Sassan, or Avi Armoni, who previously had the keys. What we would have dreamt about would have never been realized. And then there's a third team, the Melton Center. And we talk about the Melton Center, the privilege of serving a number of directors of the Melton Center, starting with, Hel starting with Alan, Alfred Zaev, Menachem, Howie, Gabi, Tzvi Beckerman. And here too, you had directors of the Melton Center, all of whom had many things on their plates. And without the tremendous commitment of staff, Carmen, Carmela, Hinda, uh, Irit, and that, this mini school could never, ever have happened. And now we come to the real story. When I was taken on in 1991, we all know that Florence had a dream. In order to really understand the complexity, I want to talk about the four Ps of every educational enterprise. In order for any educational enterprise to succeed, there are four pillars, the four Ps, which have to succeed. Every entrepreneur has four balls in the air. And in no specific order, the personnel, the participants, the payment system, and the program. And various entrepreneurs, when they start, the question is what do you start with? One of the greatest educational entrepreneurs of the century was the Chabad River. And his pillar was personal in developing the whole concept of shluchim, shluchim as they call it. He felt very strongly that if I have shluchim in the field, they will make it happen. Steinar and Rothman, when they perceived the birthright, their issue was the payment system. Then we have the recipe. We've got to find the money. And it was their brilliance in going to the Israeli government and persuading the Israeli government to take upon 30% of the cost. And they took upon 30 per cost in order to ensure that participants would go gratis that ensured the future of birthright. The JCC movement starts with the participants. Their perception is, let's get everyone through the door. They'll come to the Schweiz, they'll come to this, they'll come to that. And if we have the market share, let's find out afterwards how to make them Jewish and that's really the vision of the JCCs. Florence Melton started with the program. She said, if we can develop this program exactly as Alan described it, comprehensive, literacy, etc., this ultimately will ensure we have funding, participants, and personnel. So when I worked, walked through the door in 1991, I walked through the door of a vision called the program. Now, Florence had a great vision. There was only one problem. Nobody had ever fathomed out how this was ever going to work. <laughs> this was a highly, highly complex vision. Curriculum is something which you have in schools which teachers have to teach. How do you create a curriculum where teachers will be enticed to teach? How do you create a curriculum which will challenge students through adults? How will you have a curriculum which can be taught across the world at different borders? How can you have a curriculum which can be taught by Orthodox, conservative, reform, and people in a secular? How can you have a curriculum which can be passionately taught by somebody else? So when I walked in in 1991, we did have a framework of a curriculum, which is basically a replica of a curriculum for high school students. And really what the story was, and this was a life and death struggle, can you work out how we get to build this model? And I was extremely fortunate because in contemplating this endeavor, on my doorstep, 
arrived three brilliant people. Gary Shapira, who was the father of ethics, David Harbader, rhythms and purposes, and Daphne Siegman, ultimately dramas. These three genii, they are genii, took this challenge, and to this very day, that treasure, which is our curriculum, which is challenging teachers and students across the world, is literally what they've contributed to the Jewish people. And then we have the second tier. Mori took out the challenge of how to make the scholars curriculum. And Katriella took the challenge of how do we take this curriculum and make one that Jewish literacy for young Jewish parents. These five brilliant people, I believe, we owe a tremendous sense of debt to. And if it wasn't for their clear understanding of the vision and translating into practice, the vision of Florence would never have happened. And it was only a story about a curriculum, because then we have what we call the fifth course, the Israel Seminars. The Israel Seminars were actually started by Feria then in 1991-92, after to have Steve, and it was Chaim who came on board a little later, but it was Chaim who took the Israel Seminars with the assistance of Jonti in terms of the classical seminars, because Chaim who took the seminars to the next fantastic tier. Not only really the local seminar, the classic seminars we call it, the Janice seminar, Poland, Spain, and ultimately many, many seminars. Building a curriculum, building an IP of this value in order to ensure that it's successful, as I say, is something which ultimately I'm hoping will be seriously recognized in a manner which until this time has not been recognized. And there was one other piece to the puzzle of complexity. How do you do something in Israel? Well, something which is focused in Israel and make it work around the world. This requires a tremendous amount of commitment to the ethos. And it was actually on this issue that Judy has excelled. Judy knows that the key issue that I always had is how do we have bring everybody into sync? And it was only after Judy clearly demonstrated her passion and commitment to this ethos that the president of this university put his trust in ensuring that my success in terms of CEO would be Judy. And ultimately, you know, when we talk about things happening, Junior, there's someone sitting at the back for 16 years keeping this thing together. And her name is Tamara Katz. <laughs> Tamara came along, I had a custom. Every year, I hired a new secretary. It was immediately after a seminar or a conference. They would say to me, Yonatan, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. But thank you very much. <laughs> and it was this passion and commitment which not only kept Tamara in business, but this is really what's driven in Tamara. And we all owe her a tremendous debt of gratitude. Not to mention, if we finish off the team, in the first 10 years, Nancy is very Rina Ashkenazi, with those who literally kept the blue together, David Golan and Alison Epstein on this side, which made this happen. Alan talked about sustainability, the franchise model. And here I have a tremendous debt of gratitude to my mentor, maybe well, Dr. Martin Mendelssohn from Eversheds, who in his book, The International Book of Franchising, actually writes about the mini school and about our contribution to franchising, and of course, to Gordon's Axe. 1996, there was a momentous decision in the middle school. We raised the franchise fee from $2,000 to $8,000, <coughs> and the roof did not cave in. <laughs> this was Gordon's decision. This was a major decision. But that decision was followed by a commitment of Gordon. It was only after we did that that Gordon came up on board. And to this very day, I think has been a cornerstone in our sustainability model. And now we come to the third piece. And this proved to be the most complex issue. So we've talked about the program. We've talked about the payment system. Now we're going to talk about the personnel. We're talking about you guys. How do you develop a system where somebody is working for you but doesn't work for you? <laughs> A system where people give their heart and soul and their passion for something, but you cannot really reward them. 
That was the challenge that we faced. And here we owe a tremendous gratitude to Betsy and the staff in Chicago. Betsy built an office in which every single member of the office who stayed, and there were some people who didn't stay, had their heart and soul in this endeavor. It doesn't mean that they were support staff or what we call admin staff. I'm talking about Betsy, Sue Dickman, Judy and Michael, Jane and Michael, sorry, afterwards Judy came on board, and of course, Betty Silverman, Maureen, Kitty Hoffman, and Irene. What this group did was, they had to win over the hearts and minds of our directors of you. It was they who ensured that when you did this, you did this as a love of the Jewish people, as a love of education, you did this despite the fact that back home, you were facing tremendous political issues. You were facing tremendous pressures. You were facing issues of resources. But they ensured, and the system that they built in which the conference is a centerpiece of this. The director's conference, guys, I'm going to share with you, this a conference is a boot camp. <laughs> when we talk about conferences, we talk about people coming together in the afternoon and you go shopping, etc. etc. <laughs> this is a conference. This is where people come together from morning to night and they think about how they're going to change the Jewish people. And this is the tremendous gift which we got from our North American office and to this day, which is part of the ethos. But I can still say I cannot take it for granted. It was each and every one of you in your cities. Oh, really, Mr. Mattels? You're melting. You are melting. And your stories are noble stories, and each one has their own story. And I just want to talk about four or five stories. We just come to him, and I look at you, and I see you around the table. When God McBatstick, a few years ago, was basically fired from the job, and the mini school was closed, she walked into the Federation director and said, you can't fire me, and you can't close the school. She said, why? Because we're going to be here long, 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 many years when you're not going to be around. You can't fire me. And the reality is today, I think Barbara's here, right? Huh? Okay, so Barbara's here. I think the Federation Director's not here. Okay? When Jillian Finey in Sydney, Australia, is sitting on her back and she can't walk, and I phone her, she says, excuse me, I've just got up to, I don't know what, but one second I've got a call because we're starting Melton next week. There's no such a thing as, I can't do it. She recruited on a back. And she spoke with the passion and the vigor of somebody that's as though this was the most important, it was the most important, even though every movement that she had to make, whether it was to have food or to go to the toilet, was a pretty major story. That is what you call sacrifice. When Freddie Hoopman is sitting where she is sitting, and her budget is cut to the bone, and it almost reminds me of the story of the Exodus of Egypt, that you won't have store, straw or anything, but you've got to make as many bricks. And that's exactly what the story was. She had an agency which was shrinking. Everyone said, Freddie will do that as well. And you will do that as well. And of course you will do that as well. And Melton, and ultimately we know what the real story is. She works 26 hours a day. Because Melton, is the passion and the commitment. And to this very day, that is how she conducts her military affairs. And then we talk about Loretta. Listen, guys, what Loretta's gone through in the past few years, and it's not easy. I mean, you've got to, you are the absolute pillar of your family, and it is so easy just to say, I'm going to put Melton on hold for the next couple of years. Loretta's here today. Ray's here today. Melton is here today. These are <coughs> you guys are heroes. And it is ultimately, this is the heroism. This is the unexpected piece of the puzzle, which is the DNA of the Florence Mountain Art Medical School. Now, on a personal level, I was actually supposed to leave when I turned age of 54. I met Zalman Bernstein a couple of years ago. And I said to Zalman, we were on flowers with Mickey, and we were flying somewhere and we met him in, in the lounge. And I said to Zalman, tell me, when did you make it? Zalman said, you know, 
I did very well, but at the age of 54, <laughs> that's really when it happened. So if you ever want to make it, 54 is the age. And I talked about this for many years. Too many years. There's 54 pay and 54 men. But I owed Zalman something very important. Because Zalman, and I'm delighted that Mim is with, you, with us this, afternoon, this morning, Zalman taught me something very, very important. When you talk about your future legacy, do very, very hard. And that's something which really I've been thinking for many years and pondering when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. So the 54 came and the 54 went, and the question was when was this going to happen and how it was going to happen, etc. And as the, year, the years went on, my passion for innovation became burned more and more. I teach less and less adult education. In fact, this year I had to be persuaded to teach adult education. <laughs> I just want to teach social innovation. I'm teaching in the best year. It's not quite. I'm teaching in the, in the School of Education. But you know, when I knew my time was up, a year and a half ago, I'm giving a course and I'm teaching Clayton Christensen's so, uh, Disruptive Innovation. In innovation, there are two very important concepts. Sustainable innovation and disruptive innovation. Sustainable innovation is how you sustain organizations which exist in the moment. How you ensure they go forward. Disruptive innovation is how you disrupt markets. How you move forward, how you create new things. And I gave a lesson passionately about disruptive innovation. Put his hand up. Professor Mervis, another American, they always call me Professor. Professor Mervis, can you explain something to me? You are the director of Florence Mountain Middle School. Sustainable innovation is your policy. And you talk with such passion about disruptive innovation. How do you do it? Mm -hmm. My answer was, I don't mix business and pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> this is an academic class. If you want to find out what I think in my personal life, phone me up later. But please don't phone me. <laughs> I went home to Mickey and I said, the game's up. The game's up. I can't do this anymore. I want to be in the disruptive innovation business. Because that's really what drove me. It drove me in the time which we created the curriculum. It drove me afterwards at the time of Grandel. The creation of Grandel was a fantastic experience. It was just the previous decade, the second decade. Franz Melton was early silver. The 10 years that you had became the 10 years of Melton, became the 10 years of Navi Chai. The support, the tremendous sense of investment, the belief that you're going to make it happen, it was the same game again. The same sense of genius happened again. This time it wasn't Gary Shapiro, this time it was Nicham Ross. This time it was Tamar again, second round, second version of Tamar. This way in terms of the field, it wasn't Betsy Katz in my office, it was here in Israel, and I'm talking about Safi, and I'm talking about um, uh, Tanya, and of course about uh, Eita, who's now taking over the head of Gandal. But even Safi and Tanya and Eitan, who work with me at the moment, know that my passion isn't in running the business. My passion is in creating the business. So basically, I decided to align my two worlds and really to go into the creative business business. And here I owe tremendous depth of personal gratitude to Arthur Fried. Arthur Fried is a heavier Evichai Foundation, and ultimately the chapter of Jewish history will be written. This is the person who has changed the face of what we call Arona Sforim Ayudi, the Jewish bookshelf in Israel. He's basically behind community desk in America, now blended learning, all aspects of innovation. I met Arthur for the first time in 1986. I was the deputy principal of Pelek High School. His daughter was a student, and I didn't know what to do with my life. I went to see Arthur, and I said, Arthur, what do I do? I said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to change the world. <laughs> I said, well, I've heard that one before. He said, no, get a profession. Get a profession. I personally, I have two degrees. I have a law degree and a business degree. Get a profession and afterwards change the world. Have a secure sense of employment. And then we juggled. Was it going to be academia? Was I going to law? I flirted with law. Mike, uh, this is Mike Rose, I put convinced me it was going to be academia, and this is where I landed three years later. But Arthur 
In short, firstly, Arthur understood my soul. But on the other hand, Arthur was so practical. A couple of years later, I think I've talked to Arthur four or five times in my life. And I remember every single discussion. We had the discussion in terms of PIP, which is the early childhood program, which was going to be in North America. And it was the Avichai Foundation who decided to make a major investment in order to ensure that young families send their kids to day schools. And they made a major investment. And Arthur asked me very serious questions about the mini school. Is this a serious idea? Is it going to happen, etc.? And of course, I committed myself. And the Avichai Foundation committed themselves. Lo and behold, I'm now 2001 or 2002. I'm sitting on a bus home, and I love sitting on buses. You know, I just fall asleep. <laughs> sitting on a bus, suddenly somebody next to me, and it's pitch black. It's now, after teaching at the university, gives me a kick. He says to me, how many students are there in PIP? <laughs> Arthur Free was sitting next to me. <laughs> he was on his way to Frat to see the list and uh, I mean, basically, Arthur was saying, if you can't tell me the answer in your sleep, you're not worth the investing. <laughs> Thank God I knew the answer. I really did know the answer. And I knew the right answer. Third encounter was Arthur was over Gandalf. He talked about the dream. I said, that's a great idea, but can you make this happen? And ultimately, we did a year of research, we did secondary research. It basically proved that we don't know. Arthur put his personal face in me. And when somebody puts your faith in somebody, there's no other greater gift. A couple of years later, I'm back to Arthur. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do with my life. And I went to see Arthur, and I said, Arthur, my heart and soul is in innovation, strategic innovation, Clayton Christensen, Blue Ocean Strategy. I'd like to write a book. Arthur says, tell me what will happen to make it happen. And the result of Arthur, please God, this book is going to happen. Then I had to make the final decision about the mini school. And after I'd spoken to Wooden's Axe, the second person I shared this with was Arthur. And I went to Arthur and I said to Arthur, this is it. Now I'm going to make it happen. And Arthur read me the blueprint. And Arthur asked me this morning, is it happening? And please God, it's going to happen. So Arthur, I want to thank you. I want to thank you on a personal level. I want to thank you on an institutional level. And I really hope that ultimately, as I say, your place in terms of Jewish education, the Jewish world, will be recognized in a way that you so, so much deserve. Now, ultimately, this is a story about family. I always say the many scholars in Mishpocha. Florence used to talk about touching people on the shoulder. I always talk about Florence as being the other woman in my life. <laughs> I mean, this is about family. And this many school is so much about family. I mean, there were no hours. Uh, well, for some reason in America, they don't look at the time. I've been woken up at one o'clock in the morning. I really have. I said, guys, we checked your, do you know what the time is? Yeah, it's fine. We were sure you were working, right? Okay. <laughs> but it happens to be my wife was sleeping as well. So it was, it's not easy, I was thinking. But the reality is, this is about family and Mishpacha. And without the tremendous support of family, I've talked about my kids, we have a moment, Shlomo, Tammy, Dana, and Yohannes, not here at the moment. They've gone through this mini school, they've, it's been part of their lives. I'm talking about the campus show I taught to in terms of these Israel seminars, of which Aaron is so much part of this whole thing in terms of that and heal that, etc. I'm talking about the groups that have been in our home. Guys, I can give a good speech, a good talk. I don't make it happen in the house. It's the kids, the family make it happen. So I owe them a tremendous sense of debt and commitment. And last I want to end off with the Dva Torah. Uh, are people still here? You know, I think I wrote this book on Pir Kavod. There's a very important message from Pir Kavod. Asay l'charav v'kmei l'chachavir. Asay l'charav v'kmei l'chachavir means point for yourself a master, a teacher, and acquire freedom. And anyone who reads this, this is a very bizarre thing. Buy a friend? <laughs> friend being me is a friend being me. What do you mean buy a friend? There is one friend in this world who you acquire. And that is, I shall be connected because they A woman is acquired. Make sure the person you marry 
is your chaver. And chaver has two connotations. The first connotation is the colloquial one. Chaver, a friend, a real friend. But there's a second connotation, which Chazal brings. Chaver is a Talmud Chacham. It's someone who's smart. Marry someone who's your friend. And marry someone who is smart. And thank God I did this. As a result of this, and I'm talking about my wife and the key, everything that I've done until now, thank God, landed in the best to done in the best possible way. And without her tremendous support, passion, and commitment to everything I do, it would never happen. Thank you very much. Everyone, I just want to thank again Yon Femmervis for a remarkable contribution to Jewish education. And may we all be blessed by continuing to celebrate your achievements for many years to come. So now, uh, thank you, Howie, for sharing this uh, wonderful tribute. Thank you for all of you for joining us. Um, at 11.15 in this room,